since we're doing, this is the religious history uh, year for the Shaft Lectures, um, we've had this historical bent um, and going then and now. So if we're going to do that and we're going to have three of these, well, you just know for sure one of them's got to be about Reinhold Niebuhr. I mean, there's, there's no way you can't uh, be dealing with, if you're dealing with this subject at all, one of them's got to deal with the, the towering figure in this entire field. Uh, and all of that has almost nothing to do with the fact that I wear Reinhold Niebuhr's name around on my back anyway uh, by having that chair at Union. Um, so uh, that is where we're going uh, in this talk. The greatest American theologian of the 20th century, Reinhold Niebuhr, had the same intellectual trajectory as the other giant theologians of his generation. Karl Barth, Emil Brunner, Rudolf Bultmann, Paul Tillich. He was trained in liberal theology, he turned against it with mighty polemical force, and he was tagged as something called neo-orthodox. But like Tillich and Boltmann, Niebuhr remained essentially a liberal theologically despite the polemics. In Europe, where the anti-liberal revolt was first called crisis theology, the leading figure was Bart. European crisis theology was a reaction against the slaughter and destruction of World War I the pro-war boosterism of prominent German and liberal theologians, and the conceits of bourgeois culture. It was about shattered illusions and the experience of emptiness before a hidden God. Since the United States did not experience the war as a devastating calamity, there was no American version of, liberal the of, of crisis theology in the 1920s. It took the Great Depression to great one, where Niebuhr had the Bart role. In a normal age, Niebuhr might not have been a great theologian, since he had little theological training, and he did not do what theologians normally do. But for the American generation that endured World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, and the Cold War, Niebuhr defined what it meant for Christianity to be realistic and relevant. He got to be the greatest American theologian and social ethicist of the 20th century by changing his politics in every decade of his career. In his early career, he employed his fellow German Americans to support America's intervention in World War I. In the 1920s, he became a leading advocate of social gospel pacifism. In the 1930s, he dropped pacifism and blasted the New Deal as a militant socialist. In the 1940s, he dropped socialism and became a leader of the Democratic Party's vital center establishment. In the early 1950s, he was a leading Cold War militant. In the late 1950s, he, he protested that anti-communism had been hijacked by ideologues. In the 1960s, he turned against the war in Vietnam and called for a policy of peaceful coexistence with the Soviet Union. There were a few constants amid all these changes. Niebuhr took for granted the activist orientation of the social gospel, even as he criticized social gospel rationalism, optimism, and idealism. Theologically, he was always a liberal in his views of theological authority, revelation, historical criticism, myth, and especially Christology. He was deeply political, and he never apologized for being so. He was a brilliant interpreter of human fallibility and ambiguity. And he was always determined to be realistic, even during his liberal pacifist phase. For Niebuhr, realism was fundamentally the recognition that good and evil are inextricably linked in human nature and society, and that politics is about struggling for power. Repeatedly, he blasted his liberal Protestant tradition for being too moralistic and idealistic. Niebuhr's first attacks on liberal Protestantism called the church to throw off its moralism to join the class struggle against the dying capitalist order. Later, he called the church to throw off its moralism to join the military struggle against fascism. Later, he called the church to throw off its moralism to support America's Cold War against communism. He taught his religious and secular readers to view the world as a theater of perpetual struggles for power among competing interests. In foreign policy, realism sought a balance of power among regimes and a stable correlation of forces. In domestic policy, it conceived government as a countervailing power mediating between corporate capitalism and the trade unions. Theologically, 
Realism was rooted in the doctrine that the image of God in every human being is marred by selfishness and will to power. In the 1920s, Niebuhr tried to be a pacifist. He tried so hard that he was named president of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. But this attempt was always a strained affair. Even in the 1920s, Niebuhr protested that liberal Protestantism was too sentimental to confront the evils of the world. He warned that moral idealism had little power, even as he called for more of it to redeem American society. These awkwardly mixed feelings intensified after Niebuhr joined the faculty of Union Theological Seminary in 1928, teaching in a field, social ethics, that had no history whatsoever apart from the social gospel. By the early 1930s, the terrible wreckage of the Great Depression drove him to a sterner creed. What did it mean to be a social ethicist if one did not believe in redeemed institutions, the progressive character of history, or an idealistic theology of social salvation? Niebuhr's answer launched a new era of American theology and social ethics. In 1932, he ran for Congress on a, as a Socialist Party candidate, telling New Yorkers that only socialism could save Western civilization. He warned in Harper's Magazine, quote, it will be practically impossible to secure social change in America without the use of very considerable violence, unquote. In November, he won 4% of the vote. The following month, he published the book that changed American society and theology, Moral Man and Immoral Society. The book had an icy and aggressive tone with an eerie sense of omniscience that partly reflected his recent dependence on Marxism. Politics is about struggling for power, he admonished. Human groups never willingly subordinate their interests to the interests of others. Liberal denials of this truism were stupid. Morality belongs to the sphere of individual action. On occasion, individuals do rise above self-interest, motivated by compassion or love, but groups never overcome the power of self-interest and collective egotism that sustains their existence. There is no such thing as a moral group. For this reason, the liberal Christian attempt to moralize society was not only futile, but desperately lacking intelligence. With this book, stupid became Niebuhr's favorite epithet, followed closely by naive. Liberal idealists failed to recognize the brutal character of all human groups and the resistance of all groups to moral suasion. Secular liberals like John Dewey appealed to reason. Christian liberals appealed to reason and love. Both were maddeningly stupid. <clears throat> moral man and immoral society seized that Niebuhr's rage at the Depression and at America's aversion to socialism. Quote, he predicted, quote, the full maturity of American capitalism will inevitably be followed by the emergence of the American Marxian proletariat. <laughs> Marxian socialism is a true enough interpretation of what the worker feels about society and history to have become the accepted social and political philosophy of all self-conscious and politically intelligent citizens, unquote. <clears throat> Niebuhr urged that no amount of reformist tinkering would stop the world historical drift toward fascism. The only alternative to it was radical state socialism. Moral man in immoral society, <clears throat> perhaps the most important American theological work of the 20th century, got horrible reviews. <clears throat> Liberal Protestant leaders were incredulous, indignant, or both. They howled that Niebuhr ignored the teaching of Jesus. He had no theology of the church or the kingdom of God, and he treated his lack of faith in God's regenerative power as a virtue. Pitt Van Dusen and Francis Miller couldn't find the gospel anywhere in the book. Norman Thomas, John Haynes Holmes, and the Christian Century magazine blasted Niebuhr's defeatism. Charles Gilkey, the dean of the University of Chicago uh, Chapel, announced to his family that their dear friend Riney had apparently lost his mind. In the face of this outcry, Helmut Richard Niebuhr, 
Ryanie's younger brother, saw an opportunity. Two years earlier, he had begun teaching at Yale, and he started going by his American middle name. For many years, Richard had competed with his brother, assisted him, argued with him, looked up to him. Outside the public eye, the two regularly scrutinized each other's work and debated each other. In public, they debated only once. In 1932, in the Christian century, responding to the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. Richard spoke for non-intervention, invoking what he called the grace of doing nothing. God had God's own plans for history, and Christians are not called to make history come out right. Riney replied that Christians are called to serve the cause of justice, and there is no grace in doing nothing. Richard replied that they'd been having this argument for 30 years, and it was pointless to say anything further about it in public. They would be having no more public debates. But the following year, Richard seized the opportunity to influence his brother, telling Riney that he hated idealism, quote, with all my heart as an expression of our original sin. He found it commendable that Riney had offended so many liberals. But Riney was still one of them, and his assumptions about human nature and religion and activism and almost everything theological. On the virtue of moral man, for example, Richard asked him to consider brotherly love. For example, Richard's brotherly love. He took pride in Riney's achievements, basked in Riney's reflected glory, struggled to stand on his own feet, resented being compared to him, and felt jealous of him all at the same time. If he could love his brother despite resenting him so much, it wasn't because any ideal or will to power or will to love prevailed over his selfishness or his resentment. It was because something else that was not his will was at work long before he had a will or an ideal. Richard argued that human beings possess a moral gift of judging right and wrong, not a gift of goodness. All morally reflective people know that they are bad. Therefore, he rejected Riney's claim that individuals are morally superior to their groups. Individuals only appear to have a higher capacity for moral self-giving because coercion works better in face-to-face -face relationships. And in the private realm, it's easier to see that morality and enlightened self-interest go together. More importantly, Riney was still a liberal in the way he thought about religion. For him, religion was a power for good or ill that he wanted to use for social ethical ends. He was still a social gospeler. Richard admonished that true religion is directed toward God, not toward society. Quote, I think that liberal religion is thoroughly bad. It's a first aid to hypocrisy. It's the exaltation of goodwill and moral idealism. Has it ever struck you that you read religion through the mystics and the ascetics? You scarcely think of Paul, Augustine, Luther, Calvin. You're speaking of humanistic religion, as far as I can see. You come close to breaking with it at times, but you never really do it." Unquote. Luther and Calvin did not turn Christianity into a vehicle for social activism. Riney's frenetic chasing after social causes was spiritually corrupting. Richard put it strongly, quote, I do think that an activism that stresses results is the cancer of our modern life. We want to be saviors of civilization and simply bring down new destruction. You are about ready to break with that social activism. I think I discern that." Unquote. Well, Richard Niebuhr was dramatically wrong about the last part. For Reinhold Niebuhr, the social gospel view of religion as energy for the social struggle for justice was just a core assumption, is the very core assumption of everything that he did in social ethics. He would never say that social activism was the cancer of modern life. He took for granted that religion is a social construct. It's grounded in ethical and spiritual striving. It should be a power for social good, and it depends on human capacities for transcendence, good, and evil. But Richard Niebuhr correctly perceived that his brother didn't know where he stood theologically anymore. 
Riney had replaced the Reformation language of grace alone, faith alone, and scripture alone with a pastiche of liberal theology and politics. Then he turned to the left politically. Then he turned against the idealistic parts of liberal theology. His only clear convictions were political. Riney took that objection to heart. His next book, Reflections on the End of an Era, was the most Marxist book that he ever wrote. Yet in its closing pages, he reclaimed the language of divine providence and grace. Thereafter, he drew more and more deeply on Augustine, Luther, and Calvin, refashioning the Augustinian theology of sin, redemption, and grace. In the same year that he wrote Reflections on the End of an Era, 1934, Niebuhr dramatically resigned from the Fellowship of Reconciliation, declaring that liberal Christian pacifism was too consumed with its pretense of virtue to make gains toward justice. Quote, recognizing, as liberal Christianity does not, that the world of politics is full of demonic forces, we have chosen on the whole to support the devil of vengeance against the devil of hypocrisy. He chose to support Marxist vengeance knowing there was a devil in it, rather than allow the devil of hypocrisy to avoid conflict and preserve the status quo. To avoid any traffic with devils was simply to make oneself an accomplice to injustice and tyranny. Moral purity of any kind was an illusion. These were political arguments, however, with very hard edges. Social gospel theologians did not talk about preferring Marxist vengeance to the devil of hypocrisy. They thought that ethical idealism applied everywhere, including politics. In their revulsion against the vengeful outcome of World War I, they had turned against war. Pacifism was ascending in the mainline denominations. It spoke mostly in religious terms, and its leaders included popular religious writers like Harry Emerson Fosdick, Georgia Harkness, Vita Scudder, Kirby Page, John Haynes Holmes, Walter Russell Bowie, Richard Roberts. They appealed to the nonviolent way of Jesus as the normative way of Christian discipleship. In the mid-1930s, as I've mentioned earlier today, nearly every mainline Protestant denomination declared that it would never support another war. The Methodist Church called it war the jungle phase of civilization. Niebuhr had played a considerable role in bringing about that outcome. Now he sought to undo it by turning against it. But to challenge the pacifist ethos of American liberal Protestantism, he had to deal with Jesus not just rest with his radical politics. That was the point of his signature work, The Interpretation of Christian Ethics, published in 1935, which argued that Jesus taught an ethic of love perfectionism which was not socially relevant. Niebuhr put it starkly, quote, the ethic of Jesus does not deal at all with the immediate moral problem of every human life. The problem of attempting some kind of armistice between various contending factions and forces. It has nothing to say about the relativities of politics and economics, nor of the necessary balances of power which exist and must exist even in the most intimate social relationships." Unquote. The teachings of Jesus were counsels of perfection, not prescriptions for social order or justice. Jesus had nothing to say about how a good society should be organized. In Niebuhr's rendering, Jesus lacked any horizontal point of reference and any hint of prudential calculation. His points of reference were always vertical, defining the moral ideal for individuals and their relationship to God. Jesus called his followers to forgive because God forgives. He called them to love their enemies because God's love is impartial. He did not teach that hatred could be disarmed by returning evil with love. He did not teach his followers to redeem the world through their loving moral care. These Gandhian sentiments were commonplace in liberal sermons, but Jesus' style love perfectionism was not a social ethic. In Niebuhr's rendering, the teaching of Jesus had social relevance in only one sense. It affirmed that a moral ideal existed which judged all forms of social order. It's a good thing to have an ideal, but the ethic of Jesus, being impossible, 
offered no guidance whatsoever on how to hold the world in check. The central problem of politics, which is justice, is about gaining and defending a relative balance of power. Jesus is no help with that. Since the highest good in the political sphere is to establish justice, justice-making politics could not disavow resorts to violence. Realism rested on the Augustinian maxim that the peace of the world is gained by strife. In 1939, just before Europe descended into war, Niebuhr delivered the Gifford Lectures at Edinburgh, which were published as his major theological work, The Nature and Destiny of Man. By then, he had figured out his theology. He based his argument on the distinction between classical and biblical views of human nature and destiny. In his rendering, the classical view of Plato, Aristotle, and the Stoics held that human beings are unique within nature as spiritual beings gifted with self-reflective thought and reason. The biblical view is dialectical in conceiving the self as a created finite unity of body and spirit, a view that conflicted with idealist, rationalist, and romantic notions. Niebuhr built his theology around this idea of what he called the biblical view. God is beyond society and history. He taught, yet God is intimately related to the world. The human spirit finds a home and grasps something of the stature of its freedom in God's transcendence. Yet the self also finds in divine transcendence the limit of the self's freedom, a judgment spoken against it, and the mercy that makes judgment bearable. For Niebuhr, the heart of Christianity was the promise of salvation from humanity's enslaving egotism through divine grace. The redemptive work of God's gift of grace is to enable egotists to surrender their prideful attempts to master their own existence. Religiously, the cross is a symbol of God's judgment on human sin and God's loving forgiveness. Ethically, it's a symbol of the importance and unattainability of the law of love. Niebuhr's creative profundity in expounding this perspective was far more impressive than the scholarly foundation that he built for it. Robert Calhoun was a legendary teacher at Yale and by far the most learned American historical theologian of his generation. Calhoun ripped apart the first volume of The Nature and Destiny of Man blasting Niebuhr for distorting the past to dramatize his personal vision. In Niebuhr's telling, the prophets were always better than the wisdom literature, Hebrew religion was better than Hellenism, Paul was better than the Synoptic Gospels, the Reformation was better than the Renaissance, and so on. <clears throat> Calhoun judged that Niebuhr's statements about classical thought were misinformed to the point of being unbearable to read. He wrote shooting gallery nonsense about the Renaissance, too, he oversimplified idealism and romanticism to refute them as well. He made a mess of Hellenistic Christianity, and he showed gross ignorance of philosophy and science. As a work of scholarship, Calhoun concluded, quote, Niebuhr's magnum opus cannot be taken seriously, unquote. This attack wounded Niebuhr quite deeply. Calhoun was a master of the data, who never managed to write a major book. Niebuhr resented Calhoun's superior attitude and his judgment that the valuable parts of Niebuhr's work were projections of his own inner struggle. Yet on both counts, Calhoun was right, and Niebuhr knew it. Niebuhr's penetrating descriptions of pride and will to power obviously drew on personal experience, and he lacked the temperament and training of a scholar. But he did not reply, oh well, I'm a public intellectual who just can't be bothered with the scholarly finer points. The nature and destiny of man was based on a two-semester course at Un on Christian ethics that Niebuhr taught every year at Union. When I got there, it was the one thing assigned to me. We've always taught this course, and you have to teach it now, too. Niebuhr cared deeply about getting the arguments right. Thus, he replied to Calhoun and other critics who made similar critiques by working harder on volume two, toning down the shooting gallery atmosphere, and enlisting his wife Ursula and Henry Sloan Coffin to restrain his polemics. N Ursula did some pretty heavy rewriting in volume two. <laughs> Instead of blasting the Renaissance as in volume one, 
He criticized Barth and the reformers for denigrating Renaissance humanism. In volume two, Niebuhr began to clarify that he still belonged to the liberal tradition theologically, despite vehemently rejecting its idealism and optimism and rationalism. Of course, by then, it wasn't optimistic anyway. <clears throat> the nature and destiny of man pondered its human subject in the mode of Augustine and Calvin. This creature was driven primarily by his struggle, conscious or not, with the sin of pride. In refusing to accept his dependence, he pretended to be adequate unto himself and thus put himself in the place of God. He kept others at a distance, made himself the center of the universe, sought power over others, and usurped God's authority. For Niebuhr, hubris was the primary form of sin, and salvation was deliverance from it. Christian salvation delivered isolated selves from their pride and will and self-absorption by defeating their self-will. In his words, quote, Christianity is a religion of revelation in which a holy and loving God is revealed to man as the source and end of all finite existence against whom the self-will of man is shattered and his pride abased, unquote. This understanding of the human situation and the Christian response to it was surely a brilliant, insightful, and illuminating description of something with an ample tradition behind it and underneath it. But did it describe the universal human predicament, as Niebuhr claimed? Could it be said to account for people who were not self-centered and obsessed with power? The hallways of Union Theological Seminary were filled with women who put their husbands through seminary and sacrificed any hope of a career while taking care of their children. Were hubris and will to power their primary moral failings? Valerie Saving, a doctoral student at Union in 1958, was the first person to raise that question. She observed that when Niebuhr described man as standing at the juncture of nature and spirit, he presumably had in mind all human beings, but in fact, he generalized from his own experience and that of his colleagues. Men struggled with freedom, anxiety, and pride, but Saving argued that she and the women that she knew were far too close to nature to stand at the juncture of nature and spirit. Because pride and power were not really the issues for them. The remedy of self-sacrificial love was highly problematic for them. Daniel Day Williams, upon reading her paper, told Saving it had to be published. She later recalled that publishing it never would have occurred to me, never. Two years later, it was published in the Journal of Religion and then forgotten. Remembrance had to wait for the feminist movement and a popular anthology, Woman's Spirit Rising, edited by Carol Christ and Judy Plaskow, which republished Saving's article and gave ballast to a powerful rising tradition of feminist theology and criticism. Niebuhr is best remembered for his, his attacks on liberal pacifism and idealism in the 1930s and his strong anti-communism of the 1950s. But memory is often fitted to our stereotypes, as in these cases. Contrary to the usual rendering, Reinhold Niebuhr did not spend the 1930s urging the U.S. to arm for a battle against fascism. As late as March 1939, he was passionately opposed to preparing for war. In 1937, he condemned Franklin Roosevelt's naval buildup as a sinister evil, declaring that it must be resisted at all costs. The next year, he blasted Roosevelt's billion-dollar defense budget as, quote, the worst piece of militarism in modern history. Think of it. The worst in modern, this modern history includes Hitler, which is what this is all about. Right up to the Munich crisis, Niebuhr insisted that the best way to avoid war was not to prepare for one. Collective security was the realistic alternative to war. He wanted the U.S. to enact neutrality legislation and voluntarily support League of Nations sanctions. The fact that even Reinhold Niebuhr stridently opposed Roosevelt's preparations for war is a measure of the revulsion for war that his generation felt after World War I. Moral man and immoral society did not lead straight to the interventionism of 1940, despite all the shelves of books that will tell you that it did. Niebuhr had to struggle for eight years to get there. 
Then he had to fight to bring others along, which is what made him famous. Passionately and forcefully, he implored Americans to face up to the world emergency of 1940. In his call to arms of December 1940, to prevent the triumph of an intolerable tyranny, he declared that the Nazi regime, quote, has destroyed freedom, is seeking to extinguish the Christian religion, debases its subjects to robots who have no opinion and no judgment of their own, threatens the Jews of Europe with complete annihilation and all the nations of Europe with subordination under the imperial dominion of a master race, unquote. Only a few months later, Shortly after Pearl Harbor, Niebuhr lamented that the very same American moralists who had resisted going to war could now be counted on to clothe America's war effort with insuffer insufferable visions of a transformed world order. He could, barely, he could hardly bear the idealistic calls to war that he knew were coming. Americans habitually failed to acknowledge the power of self-interest in their politics, he lamented, and thus they insisted on moralizing even their wars and their imperial occupations. This was a major theme for Niebuhr in the late 1940s and early 1950s, even as he became a major Cold War apologist. Repeatedly, he lamented that Americans actually believe their country is the world's redeemer nation. Every president since Woodrow Wilson felt obliged to pretend that America champions world democracy with no imperial interests or designs. Niebuhr replied in The Irony of American History, 1952, quote, we cannot simply have our way, not even when we believe our way to have the happiness of mankind as its promise. In The Structure of Nations and Empires, 1959, he put it ruefully, quote, we are tempted to the fanatic dogma that our form of community is not only more valid than any other, but that it's more feasible for other nations on all other continents." Unquote. To him, a strong dose of realism about America's struggle for world power and its imperial self-interests would have been redemptive. Any moral idealism not chastened by the world's evil was pathetic and dangerous. The cynically realistic children of darkness were wise in their recognition of self-interest and will to power, but they were evil to the extent that they recognized no transcendent moral order. The idealistic children of light were good by virtue of their obedience to a moral law, but foolish in underestimating the brutal power of collective egotism and evil. In his reckoning, the fascists and Soviet communists were both children of darkness with a significant difference. Fascists lacked an inspiring ideal that appealed to others. Thus, they could be smashed directly by armed force. But communists had the moral power of a utopian creed that appealed to deluded leftists and to millions in the third world. Thus, they had to be fought differently. In essence, he believed and taught that communism was an evil religion. It was devoted to the establishment of a new universal order, not merely the supremacy of a race or a nation. In 1954, he put it sharply, quote, we are embattled with a foe who embodies all the evils of a demonic religion. We'll probably be at sword's point with this foe for generations to come, unquote. Because the utopian element of communism made it more appealing and dangerous than fascism ever was, it had to be fought in the way that the Christian West should have fought militant Islam in the Middle Ages. Niebuhr never gets called on this in the 50s. He says it over and over. Crusading attempts to wipe out the enemy directly would never work. What was needed was a patient, forceful, selective policy of containment that put the Soviets on the defensive. Like his friend George Kennan, Niebuhr believed that eventually the Soviet Union would self-destruct on its failures and its internal contradictions. The chief purpose of Cold War containment was to heighten the pressure on an unworkable Soviet system. These were the foreign policy keynotes of a vital center liberalism that claimed the mainstream of American politics in the 1950s and for many of us simply defined the central political truths of our lifetime. But in the late 1950s, Niebuhr began to say that anti-communism had become way too ideological and overly militarized. He called for a policy of no first use of nuclear weapons. 
In the early 60s, he supported America's war in Vietnam. But in 1966, which is pretty early, he joined the anti-war movement, lamenting that his country had turned the Vietnamese Civil War into an American imperial war. The carnage and futility of the war sickened him. He confessed, quote, for the first time, I fear I am ashamed of our beloved nation. To his astonishment, he found himself writing, quote, perhaps there's not really so much to choose between communist and anti-communist fanaticism, particularly when the latter has caused us to stumble into the most pointless, costly, and bloody war in our history. Well, it wasn't really the, most blo the bloodiest war in our history, uh, but he felt it uh, by then, causing people like Ram Paul Ramsey to complain that Christian realism has simply been given up. Even Reinhold Niebuhr, Ramsey said, even Reinhold Niebuhr now signs petitions against wars as though Reinhold Niebuhr had never existed. <laughs> Thus did the Cold War liberals back away from the ravages of anti-communist containment in Vietnam. A long succession of administration officials in the Johnson and Kennedy administrations followed Niebuhr in repenting of imperial overstretch. The catastrophe in Vietnam fueled an explosion of new social movements. Two contrasting reactions to the exotic turbulence of the time had special pertinence for the fate of Niborian theology. Liberation theology and neoconservatism. Both movements had people who were former Niborians or thought of them still as being Niborians. Liberation theology was an eruption of repressed voices. Ruben Alves charged that Niborian realism was essentially a nationalistic ideology defending the dominant U.S. American world order. Cornel West described Niborianism as, quote, a form of Europeanist ideology that promotes and legitimates U.S. hegemony in the world, unquote. As for neoconservatism, from its beginning in the, neo in the 1960s, neocons have claimed to be Niborians, and in fact, some of them were. This is, a, this is a very large, complex, and important subject on which I've written two large books and for which I have no time whatsoever today except to say one thing. <laughs> if only the neocons had absorbed half of Niebuhr's realism on their way to becoming Republicans, we might have been spared the very bad idea of invading Iraq. On America's original sin, Reinhold Niebuhr was far better than most white theologians of his generation. He cared deeply about racial justice, and he wrote nearly a dozen articles about it, usually describing racism as a transcendently evil form of self-worship. Racism ignored the conditioned character of our life and culture, he wrote. It feeds on the pretense that one's race or culture represents some final good. Ultimately, it's a spiritual issue. For the sin of racism is an especially toxic form of evil as egotism. But Niebuhr never featured this subject in his major works or gave it high priority in his activism. In the 1940s and 50s, he was much too impressed with Gunnar Myrdal's seminal work, An American Dilemma, which recycled harmful stereotypes about the supposed backwardness and pathology of African-American culture, even as Myrdal stood against racial discrimination. Niebuhr did the same thing, asserting that Negro culture was backward and distorted on account of discrimination. On the ethical harm of perpetuating stereotypes, Niebuhr was insufficiently sensitive. And on the perils of liberal false righteousness, he was oversensitive. The problem of false righteousness is a serious and slippery one that has a way of turning on itself. And it held back Niebuhr's prophetic voice on this subject, which after all was the subject of that time. He stressed that when white liberal Christians apologized to blacks or Jews for the sins of white America, they might win moral points for humility or contrition, but wrongly, because confessions of this sort were always dictated by moral pride. Thus they carried a whiff of hypocrisy. Instead of expressing a real contrition or a real confession, the penitent communicated his or her moral superiority. Repeatedly, Niebuhr warned northern white liberals to go slow on that account. For example, in 1957, Martin Luther King Jr. asked Niebuhr to support a petition asking President Eisenhower to enforce the Brown decision in the South. 
Niebuhr turned him down, explaining that he opposed anything that smacked of Yankee interference or moral presumption. Throughout the 50s, he cautioned liberal Democrats and civil rights leaders to slow down and wait for what he always called the slow erosion of racial prejudice to do its work. My teacher at Harvard, Preston Williams, once put it to me vividly. When Dr. King was moving, Reinhold Niebuhr was always saying, too fast, too fast. <laughs> On one occasion, however, in 1956, Niebuhr threw caution aside by calling out Billy Graham. Niebuhr had a very low opinion of Graham's evangelistic enterprise, which he expressed plainly and brutally on numerous occasions. He was very snotty about Graham. <clears throat> he was appalled that for millions of Americans, Billy Graham represented Christianity. But in 1956, near the end of one of his typical slams on Graham, Niebuhr switched to moral exhortation urging Graham to do something ethically useful with his fame. In his early career, Graham preached to segregated audiences, er assuring that Jesus had no opinion on the matter. Then for three years, he zigged and zagged on segregation, sometimes standing against it, sometimes backsliding, until the Brown decision, after which he preached only to integrated audiences. Niebuhr admonished him to go further by preaching against racial prejudice and the everyday racism of his audiences. For years afterward, Graham struggled with Niebuhr's challenge, as he later acknowledged. Graham's record during the Civil Rights Movement was highly ambiguous and loaded with ironic complexity, unlike the whitewashed things he later said about it. But notice the working of the liberal righteousness problem in this case. Reinhold Niebuhr called out Graham publicly, stressing that the most violently racist sections of the country were the ones that had the most revivals. He challenged Graham to an extraordinarily difficult task, one entailing dangers and burdens from which Niebuhr was far removed. Niebuhr had no contact at all with Graham's audiences, and by the 1950s, he faced little prospect of confronting angry crowds of any kind. But even in his rarefied world of seminaries and lectureships, Niebuhr did not take the risk that he prescribed for Graham, that of challenging his group to interrogate its white supremacism. Asking white liberals of the 1950s to acknowledge their casual racism would not have gone well. It would have evoked, for Niebuhr, the kind of hostility that Graham confronted constantly even as Graham tried not to offend the moral pride of his audiences. Liberals took pride in having no racial biases. That's what made them liberals. Had Niebuhr done in his context what he challenged Graham to do in his, Christian social ethics would have gotten much farther in interrogating the culture of white supremacy, a structure of power based on privilege that presumes to define what is normal. Today, Niebuhr's name is back in public discussion because he symbolizes the road not taken by the Bush administration in foreign policy, after which Barack Obama announced that Niebuhr was his favorite political thinker. For progressives like me, he symbolizes the possibility of a progressive ethical realism. Repeatedly, he insisted that any realism lacking a moral dimension is corrupt. By that standard, most realism was and is corrupt. For Hobbes, Machiavelli, and other founders of the realist tradition, the whole point of realism was to divorce politics from ethical factors, which is why Niebuhr characterized them as children of darkness. In the past half century, realism has justified US support for apartheid in South Africa and alliances with dictators in Indonesia, the Philippines, Chile, Argentina, and a long list of others, always in the name of strategic interests. Niebuhr's attempt to fuse realism to ethics much less the love ethic of Jesus, constantly courted the danger of selling out the ethics. To hold together the worldly cynicism of the realist tradition and the prophetic morality of Jesus and the Bible, one needs a very high tolerance for ambiguity and paradox. Even to try, as Niebuhr did heroically, one has to be terribly serious about the ethical presumption against war and the biblical favoritism toward the poor and oppressed.
Otherwise, the ethical part of ethical realism is just mere cover for nationalistic will to power. The social gospelers tried to moralize the public square, but Niebuhr pleaded with them to stop because politics is a struggle for power driven by interest and will to power. The social gospel taught that a cooperative commonwealth was achievable, but Niebuhr replied that the very idea of a good society ideal had to be given up. This disparagement of the good society idea was costly for Christian ethics. The idea of a good society emerges from discussion, and it's always in process of revision. To let go of it is to undercut the struggle for attainable gains toward social justice, negating the elusive but formative vision of what it is that's worth struggling for. Without a vision of a just society that transcends the prevailing order, ethics and politics remain captive to the dominant order, restricted to marginal reforms. The borders of possibility remain untested. Moral man and immoral society drew the lines that are still at issue. Niebuhr repudiated the liberal Protestant belief that the ethos of a moral community can be insinuated into the public realm. Politics isn't about community or ethical aims. Since the liberal Christian quest for a politics of community was an illusion, the recourse for Christian ethics was to strengthen the capacity of the state to act as a moral guarantor. Social ethics focused on consolidating state power for relatively good ends. Niebuhr's closest colleague, John Bennett, would often said, you know, Niebuhr's chief interest was always just the question of what the government should do about this or that issue. To enlist the church in that enterprise, Niebuhr distinguished between the moral identity and the social mission of the churches. The social mission was no longer the social project of converting American society to a biblical vision of freedom, justice, community, peace. Realism was about providing religious support for a secular liberal agenda that served the struggle for freedom and justice. Niebuhr's attentiveness to irony and paradox his insistence on the inevitability of collective egotism, and his sensitivity to the complex ambiguities inherent in all human choices made permanent contributions to Christian thought and brilliant contributions. His passion for justice roared through all his work, through all of his political changes. But this dichotomy between the moral identity and social mission of the church did weaken the church's identity and social agency helping to strip the public sphere of the very language of moral value. The upshot was ironic, because nobody struggled more brilliantly than Niebuhr to make Christianity relevant to modern society. Near the end of his life, Niebuhr warned Wolfhard Pannenberg and young Richard John Newhouse to steer clear of the kingdom of God. The social gospel proved that the kingdom idea was a loser, he admonished, <clears throat> Any appeal to the biblical idea of the kingdom as an inbreaking spiritual and historical reality is bound to produce disasters. It made Rauschenbusch incorrigibly naive about how to relate Christianity to politics. Niebuhr declared that if it were up to him, he would tear the kingdom of God out of the Bible and Christian doctrine. Well, that's an over-the-top expression of the problem of realism that I just described. Niebuhr's theology had room for the sovereignty of a creator God and the redeeming power of divine love mediated through the cross of Christ. But when he invoked the authority of what he called reality for Christian ethics, he did not mean the reality of God's transforming presence in the spirit of Christ, nor was he prepared to cut against the grain of America's reality. And that is why he never opposed an American national interest in the name of Christian ethics. There's just not a single example that you can point to in which he did that. Niborian realism was reduced to support work for anti-communism and other causes endorsed by the liberal establishment. And therefore, it left Christianity without enough to say or do in its own language, in its own way, and for its own reasons. For decades, Many readers wondered how anybody as cynical and depressing as Niebuhr could be a prophetic social theorist, or at least could be regarded as one. I've heard this question from my students every year. <clears throat> he seemed to revel in dispiriting proclamations, such as 
The possibilities of evil grow with the possibilities of good. Any gain toward a good end simultaneously creates new opportunities for evil. Every gain in equality, freedom, and democracy engenders new possibilities for tyranny, squalor, and anarchy, giving rise to new kinds of unanticipated consequences and enabling greater numbers of people to do evil things. Well, that's pretty depressing. How are people supposed to rally around that? Why would they even bother? Niebuhr skirted this question his entire career. Why? Because it was never a serious one for him. He didn't experience it existentially. He was an ebullient, passionate personality who took his own Christ-following passion for justice for granted. And he had no capacity for introspection whatsoever. <clears throat> At least not directly. It could only be indirect. <clears throat> only in a few scattered references and interviews did he ever refer to this problem in a way that bordered on self-disclosure? For Niebuhr, the love ethic of Jesus was always the point, the motive, and the end, even when it had no concrete social meaning. Since he followed Jesus, he had to take up responsibility for society's problems, even if Jesus did not. In his own way, sorting out the paradoxes of that fundamental paradox Reinhold Niebuhr was always rooted in and sought to be faithful to the love ethic to which the word of the gospel called him. No, thank you, Frank. <clears throat>